Hi, this is Paul. Here's the question, and I think it's an important one, and I think it's a moment to pause and think and watch ourselves and reflect on what's happening and what's going on. Should police and officials kneel and march with protesters? Now, I've been watching the Twitter, and Chloe Valdery, if many of you don't know who she is, I didn't know who she was, maybe found her six, eight months ago. She had done a conversation early on with Brett Weinstein. She has her own podcast. She has her own project. She's written for the New York Times. Um, Interesting writer and thinker. And Ben Shapiro tweeted, It is excellent that police officers are expressing solidarity with those protesting police brutality. It is terrible that both protesters and officers have adopted the Kaepernick kneeling symbology, which indicts America, which indicts America writ large as a racist nation. And Chloe says, no, it doesn't, Ben. And a little bit later, Chloe commented, "Um, to the black people telling random white people on the street to kneel in front of them, stop that. To the white people doing it, stop that. This is a moment for justice plus equality. If you kneel to me, you're not my equal. Okay. So what's happening now is moments of tension. Uh, Brett tweeted something. Brett Weinstein tweeted something earlier in the day. And one word came out to me from it. Um, Look down on any of these delicate situations where the cops and protesters are bootstrapping a new form of group peace negotiation. I think that's exactly right. That's what's happening in live, real time on the street. I would argue there's something sacramental happening. Okay? There's something, if you've been keeping up with my videos, you understand what I mean by that. There's something sacramental happening. It's happening with bodies and people in real time and space, but it has to do with something much bigger, and everybody in the crowd knows it. So what if the cops are on their feet or kneeling? What does it matter what body posture they have? This is a religious question. The new atheists are done. Religion is quite obviously here to stay. But what is religion? What is religious? How can we how can we negotiate this? Now ask yourself this question. What are the chances that one person in the photo prefers violence? Hi. All it takes is one. So now we're at another question. What is a human being? What happens in our relationships? So I think Brett had the language exactly right. Bootstrapping a new form of negotiation. Is kneeling capitulation of authority or is kneeling solidarity? Now, James Lindsay, who has been on the channel, um, posted, you know, remember like two, even four or more years ago when my colleagues and I were saying it is a religion? Need I post the receipts? Uh, That's right, James, and that's the conversation we had. And it is, in fact, religious, and that's what caught my attention in the teens. I was watching what I call progressive liberationism arise and thought, this is a religion. And its roots are um, very much connected with Calvinism. And when I heard James talk that way on a podcast, um, I don't know if I could still get him on my channel, but I contacted him right away and said, I want to talk to you. And we had a wonderful conversation. Um, and then I posted a, a little link to a little clip from Leap of Faith with Steve Martin, because look at the hands in the air, taking a knee. If an anthropologist swooped in from another place and saw all of this, they would say America is a deeply religious nation. Look at all that religious posturing. Look at all that religious behavior. Now, Esther um, tweeted at me, is there, is there... Is there more context anywhere for this? Were these people already Christians? Was there actual prayer going on? Oh, Esther, you're you're not thinking of what you learned or should have learned from Jordan Peterson. First we act and we watch each other and the words come later. Okay? We act religiously. This is what we do. Now again, and I would say, well, is there context for them? This talk to Tom Holland. You know, and to somebody else on Twitter, I said, well, middle-aged Karen in the COVID, you know, the roots are showing. The roots are showing. Um, Call and response. Now, a lot of people are looking back to the civil rights movement. 
with reason. And I encourage people on Twitter, before you enact the civil rights magic words and magic action of marching down the street together, why don't you pick up a book and read about what people who changed history, what it took for them to change history. It wasn't just marching down a street. It wasn't just making signs. It wasn't just saying the magic words and singing the magic songs. Now, why would I have to say this now? What's the context? Well, this is deep in the context. What is spirit? You might see some of my recent videos. Spirit is that which moves the physical from beneath and behind. And almost nobody has exercised that word from their vocabulary, even hardcore modernist materialists. Now, John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry, the black guys on bloggingheads.com, have been talking about this stuff for a very long time. And if you haven't been listening to them, you're not keeping up with some of the best voices in the race conversation. John McWhorter's been noticing, now John is a is a atheist materialist to the best that I can tell. Glenn has a much more interesting story and I, I know I heard, or at least I thought I heard, that Glenn was working on a memoir, which is something I want to read very, very badly because Glenn did a conversation that I mentioned in a video a while ago with, oh, uh, what's his name? He's the head of the, he's the organizer, he's the ringleader of Blogging Heads, and, and where Glenn walked through his story of Christian conversion and then walking away from the faith. It's a vital story. It's a deep story. And so Glenn is a little hesitant about John's observation, but I'm down with John on this. And in this story in the Atlantic, John was, you know, call it ideas in the Atlantic, just to give them a little bit of space here. Um, he's riffing on third wave, fe third, um, shouldn't be way, third wave feminism. First wave was about voting rights. Second wave about workplace rights. Third wave about gender identity. It's sort of the Protestantization of, you know, in a sort of Barfieldian evolution of consciousness way. It's the Protestantization of feminism. The same thing has happened with anti-racism, and I'm probably going to start calling it um, structural anti-racism or systemic anti-racism because I think that more properly articulates it and frames it in reference to everyone who wants to use those words with respect to racism. So so structural or systemic anti-racism. First there was abolition, then there was civil rights, and now I would argue there's the racial imaginary that in a sense follows the gender imaginary that third wave feminism is working on. And, and John goes on to say, well, anti-racism is a religion. Right? He's not meaning that in a flattering way. Um, white privilege is sort of like original sin, he says, and uh, total depravity, more like, I think. Um, the, the, the doctrine of original sin is a very complex and I suspect misnamed thing. It's really the doctrine of original guilt. But that leads us down a whole nother rabbit trail that I don't want to go down right now. Owning your privilege is your act of confession and you need a priest to do it. And in the video, um, one video, John McWhorter talked about a, a conference that he went to and someone proudly talked about how this person had a a person of color come to them every week to school them in their white privilege. And this was something he was very proud of. And John McWhorter listened to that and said, well, he's got a pastor. If, you know, he's got a pastor, he's got a priest, he's doing his confession. Um, judgment day, or really I would again tinker with that because, you know, if you're theologically trained, you tend to tinker with these things. It's really the day of the Lord because the day of the Lord is a day of revelation. It's the day when racism ends, and, and now there's a pre-echo, again, listen to my sermon from last Sunday, there's a pre-echo quality to it, and so John McWhorter quite reasonably, as a materialist, says, when is this day going to come? How are we know this? How will we know this day has come? We, on one hand, can't mark the improvements that we've seen some from the civil rights days. We can't admit to them, but here we're imagining that 
our marching in the street is going to end police brutality and racism and me complaining i'm sick and tired of it oh i'm sorry if you're sick and tired of it all the racists will stop now and when i hear things like this as a pastor i think have you ever met a human being Oh, you think people, and often people think this, this is the way things work in church. The pastor gets up on stage and tells the people what they shouldn't do, and then the people stop. Anybody who believes that has never been a parent, never been a school teacher, never been a police officer, never been a pastor, because it doesn't work that way. In fact, I can think of what I want and what I want to stop in my life, and then I don't do it. For those of you who know your Bible, read Romans 7. And then Sunday... Megan Wester, I don't know who she is, but hashtag church close, her Black Lives Matter. Some protests, some clergy pray, others put their bodies and soul on the line. They go to the organization with their vestments on. It's not anywhere near as metaphorical, John McWhorter, in terms of it being religious as you think it is. It is being practiced in places and the religious right, as Jack Jenkins writes about, might not be recognized, the religious left might not be seen, but they're out there. And I don't have to say anything. They say it for me. But there's a political lag going on, and two great pieces that, um, that, that, and, that Andrew Sullivan po you know, um, posted on Twitter today, I caught both of them from him, um, Hub City Riot Ninjas. And in fact, yesterday I saw a video on Twitter of two white women spray painting Black Lives Matter on a Starbucks and the, the black community organizer went up to them and said, stop it, you're hurting the cause. And they were all dressed up as ninjas and it's like, oh, so I'll put the link to that article. Very much read it, but both Douthat and... and I don't know who wrote the other one. I can't read the, t the text is too tiny. They're making the point that, well, liberalism, modernist liberalism is in decline. That's the point that Dr. Jim made and, and how we understand the rise of Jordan Peterson and the crisis of the liberal city. Again, both pieces, really excellent, vitally important in terms of understanding what's going on. But before that, we saw it in the church. Now, what's this question of progress that I've been mulling over since reading Douthat's book and hearing Douthat on the portal with Eric Weinstein and listening to Peter Thiel and asking these questions about, about, about progress? Isn't it interesting that this is the week that, once again, well, America launched men into orbit and it's the week it's like it's the 70s all over again and last time i saw the 70s i had hair again i really recommend this chapter in the pastor in a secular age to get up to speed on kind of a, a lot of pastors and christian scholars have been james k a. smith has been doing that have been sort of pre-chewing Charles Taylor for a more popular audience. And what Andrew Root does here, I think, is, is really helpful and important and, in fact, vital. And he's sort of walking through tracing the West by tracing the pastoral vocation. For Jonathan Edwards, flourishing was a sign that we were in a society bent towards salvation, reflecting heaven. And go back and watch my video on the establishing of New Haven, Connecticut. And why are those, those New England cities built the way they are? And read these, um, these Puritan and Reformed founders of the New England colonies and what exactly they were trying to establish. It's vitally important. Well... Her, uh, Fosdick, who became much more the modernist preacher in the in the 19th and 20th century, what 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 Root does is say, here's an example preacher. Here's an example preacher. In Fosdick's time, human flourishing could become could become its own end. Now, if you listen to Sam Harris, that's exactly what you hear. Now, you hear it from an atheist. You hear it from someone who's made a career out of saying there is no God. 
he's just an echo of Fosdick. But Fosdick was a theist. So why are the theists and the atheists sometimes not so easy to distinguish from one another? In Fosdick's time, human flourishing could become its own end, cut loose from any sacred purpose. Yet we needed pastors to remind us to avoid that which turned us personally from flourishing, like drinking and gambling that attack the affirmation of ordinary life and to call titans of industry to remember their responsibility to keep the world a dependable place where machines helped people flourish and not flounder. The pastor felt no malaise because he was the chaplain of the dawning secular age, adding religious mor moralism to the system that had turned our ordinary lives into something fully secular. In a world that had become fully secular, the pastor became the manifestation of our conscience, our better gods, holding an important and meaningful place. Yet when Fosdick died in October 1969, the importance and esteem of the pastor was about to come under attack it couldn't anticipate. As the South was set ablaze by racial conflict and the new media of television awakened the North to the evil of our national apartheid, pastors cut from the cloth of Fosdick boarded buses outnumbered only by college students. The pastor was the conscience of our secular ordinary lives, working and speaking for human flourishing. There was no place he, needed, um, he was needed more than in the South. Not only were African Americans in the South not flourishing, but the racists were attacking their ordinary lives, bombing churches and keeping them from diner counters, bus seats, and drinking fountains. Pastor Martin Luther King Jr. may have understood American Protestantism better than anyone else. By staging resistance at the center of ordinary life, again on buses and at diners, he revealed an overwhelming lack of flourishing. White mainline pastors couldn't but act, calling on President Kennedy and Johnson in Washington to do the same. Is it like 1969 all over again, 51 years later? Participation in the civil rights movement would be the last and best victory for the Fosdyke type pastor. In many ways, it would be the very summit, the high point on the line graph, which signaled both peak and simultaneously the decline of the pastor's influence. And this drop in importance and trust in the Fosdyke type, Fosdick type pastor would be steep. As the late 1960s dawned and a new age of authenticity took root, which we discussed at length in volume one, he has a first volume to this book, the large youth culture decided that it could not trust the leaders of the societal structures to work for human flourishing. As the blood of 18-year-olds filled rivers in Vietnam, those in power, whether in Alabama or Washington, were painted as fascists, seeking their own power over human flourishing. The whole system was labeled corrupt, and to their, very surpri and to their surprise, so too were the chaplains of the secular age. Organized, particularly Protestant mainline, Fosdick-like religion was seen as a pawn for the powerful, corrupt in its own right. White mainline pastors, of course, pointed to their work for racial equality, holding up the battle scars they'd earned during their march to Selma. But it was too late. Even those pastors who fully embraced the new ideologies following, for example, the death of God theology were painted as disconnected and backwards. Now think about Douthat and his decadence thesis. Think about the continual return. Have we moved much past this? First the preachers than the politicians. Read the whole article. I'll read a little bit of it. Now that it's been lit, the liberal coalition's claim to represent order against Trumpian chaos or political competence against right-wing right fecklessness is burning day to day. The mayors and governors of many of these cities are as woke a, woke a governor or, or as black a mayor as you could want. 
I, I watched the mayor of Atlanta pleading with people as they're burning their city down. Uh, their city, as she said, our city is the capital of the civil rights movement. What are you doing? Does she have authority with the crowd? Why not? And the torches of its credibility has happened fastest among the white and the woke. As public officials, white progressives lack both credibility with aggrieved protesters and full control over their overzealous cops. As supposed custodians of public health, we've proven unable to sustain social distancing requirements when it's someone other than the disreputable conservative challenging them. And as ostensible champions of fact and reason, they've been as quick as any southern sheriff in the 1960s to blame outside agitator, agitators, false flags, and even foreigners for their own misgovernment. Ouch. Now, in 1960, when my father became pastor of Northside Community Chapel, Christian Reformed Church, in Patterson, New Jersey, he, in a sense, was still part of that older generation. As my father was there, the clerical collar came off, the hair got longer, the side beards got longer. What was happening? What was happening in the church? What was happening in the streets? I just did a conversation with, with Preston Sprinkle and told a bit about my father, where my father grew up in the Midwest in, in Dutch immigrant enclaves out on the farms and he came to Patterson, New Jersey with humility and love and learned from the people there how to pastor them and was deeply loved. You can still go to Patterson and in the first ward and ask about Rev that used to be at Northside now decades ago and there'll be many who remember him and many who still love him. Well, he learned in that era and he learned to love. But he, he, what he did was he took many rituals and he extended them. Rituals and traditions of leadership. Those rituals increasingly communicated, however, for many, and that's what Douthat is talking about, corruption and inauthenticity. And so everything went from above to among. All right? Now remember the question we began this video with. Should the soldiers and the cops kneel with the audience are they above ben shapiro says better not do that um chloe valdery says well you know don't ask someone to kneel because that's inequality and we should pause we should pause we should slow down we should stop reacting we should think what's going on why? When you have a line of soldiers, it's one thing. And when they bow down, it's another. But should they bow? Well, of course, white, tall, innocent Stan Vanderclay goes to Patterson, New Jersey and becomes a hero to many people. But now it's time for everyone to be their own hero. What does that mean? Now you have representation. To establish credibility, the mainline rush to find clerics marginalized enough. But of course, every time you ordain a marginalized person, what you're doing is you're entering into that holy moment where the person at the bottom of the hierarchy now ascends to the top of the hierarchy, but they themselves are then tainted by the hierarchy itself. But of course, every time you ordain a marginalized person, you make them a part of the establishment, setting them up to fall too. Wash, rinse, repeat. There's a cruel irony in this generation. They're stuck somewhere between what Jonathan Haidt has recognized and what Steve Jobs promoted. This generation, as Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukanoff have laid out very well, was taught to appeal to authority by expressing their true nature. If you ask a 20-something why they're out on the street, 
what they're trying to do, they will say something like, we need to express, we need to speak, we need to show how we feel. Where did they learn this language? Well, Jonathan Haidt points out, what were they taught in school? They were taught to go and appeal to authority and to make things right because the authority will do so. And that's where you get all of that whole conversation. But they were also taught by Steve Jobs. And what did Steve Jobs in this Stanford commencement address with, well, Jordan Peterson has 5 million views on his um, first episode of the biblical series, but Steve Jobs has 35 million episodes of his Harvard commencement speak speech. Don't listen to authority. Make your own. Now, people aren't putting these two ideas up and realizing, oh, there's a tension there. The tension's all in here. And now they're acting it out on the street. They are taught that they are the hero and that there is no hero above that they are emulating and that all the other peeps, they're sort of non-player characters. And, well, I saw a great tweet from, you know, how white people are and here's this woman from, blonde woman from Game of Thrones surrounded by all the brown people and she's their savior. I saw like 15 minutes of one episode of Game of Thrones and it was that. It was, it was the blonde woman coming in to free all the women from the raping and marauding barbarian men. And I thought, oh boy, not quite as woke as we thought we were, were we? A trope like this? Really? Wait, you know, it's taken straight from colonial? But aren't Aren't the white folks still casting themselves in that role? Aren't they ironically doing it on the street? How can they resolve this tension between just telling authorities how we feel and teacher will come and take care of the bully and there'll be peace and justice on the playground? And Steve Jobs, don't listen to authority. Cut your own way. Make your own path. Express yourself. It's Sheilaism meets... Jonathan Haidt. And so they're thrashing about. But worse than progressive officials are the young white radicals, anarchists and Antifa and would-be Tyler Durdens, who have decided that the the suffering black community is an excellent justification for frenzy of white-on-white or sometimes white-on-immigrant-owned business crime. One of the most striking trends in the last few years, studies have shown that white liberals are increasingly angrier about racism than the average black American. It's my experience. I've most of my ministry in North America has been with black folks who were raised in Jim Crow South. Yeah, they'll tell you about racism. They see it all the time, but you get a sense they're not quite as naive as this crew that was raised on the schoolyard to ask for teacher to fix it. And, and I look around and I say, is the main, is your main project to ask for white people to save you? This is your liberationist narrative? And this is exactly what John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry bring out so absolutely, so absolutely well in all of their videos. You're infantilizing African Americans. You're, these are the, as as John McWhorter says often, this is the only group of people that can't overcome struggling odds. They need a helping hand from the great white master. I've said it on Twitter dozens of times. I don't see people white, I don't see more, I don't see P, I don't see white people more colonial than when they're doing this stuff. It's like, you're yelling about colonialism, but you're acting just like 19th century colonialists.
One of the most striking trends of the last year is the study showing that white liberals are increasingly angrier about racism than the average black American has reached its consummation in the spectacle of peaceful black protesters remonstrating the white kids who just want to loot and burn and fight. And Jordan Brown, I posted it on my blog. You can find it at paulvanderclay.me. People breaking windows out of restaurants in Eugene, I guess it's Eugene, Oregon. People who were, you know, leading chounce. And here's this one woman just pleading at them, stop, stop. We're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to perform the ritual. And you're looting. Well, maybe those who are trying to perform the ritual shouldn't just look at pictures in black and white from the historical archives, but read, read what it took, what they did, who they were, how this movement culminated in years of suffering, training, there's a reason the book is this fat. Ah, but back to the question. Should they kneel or not kneel? Sophia Lee, if you go back in my channel, you'll find I had a conversation with Sophia. She's a journalist at that time. Maybe she still is. I don't know. She was working for World Magazine. And she had a string of tweets on Twitter today that, are, that I thought were right there. Protesters and National Guard face off protesters asking them to march with them. Now, I got to bring Benjamin Boyce in here because it's don't, I don't think it's completely unfair that Ben's project and Brett Weinstein's and Heather Hyings, I hope I'm saying her last name right, Weinstein, Heather Hyings, sorry about the last names. I'll try and do better. Their experience at Evergreen they, they got some massive deja vu going on. Because isn't this sort of what happened? Which narratives are we playing out? And so, and so Ben's watching this stuff saying, I remember the Evergreen president. I remember. Put your arms down. And they all laughed at him. What was going on? Did the students know? Did the president know? Now, the president had been formed in a religious liturgy that the entire school got down with. I mean, the, the problem with uh, religious colleges is not so much the colleges that know they're religious. It's the colleges that are religious and don't know it. If you think that, I don't want to name names. I don't have to name names. They're all over the place. If they're Most of them. If you think... American universities aren't promoting religion. You don't know what religion is. And then they take a knee. And like Sophia says, the people are ecstatic. Oh, we're getting very religious here. They're taking a knee and they're into ecstasy. Have you ever read a religious text? Do you know why people go to church? Do you know that you know, I've got people, well, psychedelics. You know, let me tell you, religious people, after years of training, have created institutions and community wherein they can go into flow states and experience ecstasy very quickly. I know how to do it. I do it all the time. Pastor, you're not a Pentecostal. You're, you're kind of a little cynical Dutch Calvinist, frozen chosen. Do you? How do you do ecstasy? Not with a chemical. I do it with religious practice. The people are ecstatic when they all take a knee. But Ben, Benjamin Boyce, he has a sense, I've watched this movie before. And I'm not sure, and Chloe's working it out. I'm, I'm not pointing fingers saying, I have the answers. Again, what's taking place right now is sacramental. It's spiritual. And we're, we're trying to, to, to figure out what's going on where? The Apostle Paul would say, in the heavenlies. Now, maybe a sociologist would use a fancy German word like the zeitgeist. 
this isn't religious can you please tell me this isn't religious the hands up the singing the kneeling the kneel with us march with us isn't this a form of evangelism Sophia goes on. Okay, I'm hearing he was a looter. Uh-oh. They were just kneeling a minute ago, but there's a looter. But, but someone else is also telling me he didn't do anything and was simply running to a friend. Guess we'll find out. Well, does looting and running, you know, if you're a police officer, you see someone running, it's, it's kind of like running in front of a dog. It's like, boom. Also, some people seem here for the photo ops. Why? Why? See, first you have the religion, then you have the echo, and then you want to appropriate the religion. So, selfie with me, I made it to the protest. I don't want to be stuck home in a COVID pandemic when there's religion going on out in the street. West 28 was the guy who engaged in a conversation with the National Guard. He told them, we're all human beings. Look up Jonathan Gray. Look up Jonathan Gray humanism. Jonathan Gray says, you know, seeing us as all human beings, it's, it's, that's just Christianity light. Look up Tom Holland. It's Christianity light. It's not natural, is it, for us to see us all as human beings? We're all human beings. We know we share the same humanity. Are these religious words? But when you, hear, but when you wear that uniform, you are part of the system. Oh, we've got humans and the system. Systemic racism, systemic anti-racism. Systems, systems, systems aren't, aren't human. Be very careful right there. Go back and look on my videos on Nazis. Read Timothy Snyder. What did the Nazis try to do? Why were... Why did the Nazis want to kill the Jews? Well, they were racist. Eh, it wasn't that simple. They had an ideology. They had a belief system. They believed that the problem with human beings is systems. So if you get rid of the systems, natural things will flourish. That's Nazi ideology, which is why, again, read Timothy Snyder. Please read Timothy Snyder. Timothy Snyder would come in and say, yeah, the Nazis got rid of states. The Soviets kept putting up the state. The Nazis kept tearing down the strait. Read Bloodlands, where they went back and forth and back and forth. Soviets would pump it up a state. Nazis would tear the state down. Why? We need to get rid of all this state so that natural, what's natural can emerge. But that humanism you see, that's exactly what the Nazis said. That isn't natural. We're not equal. I am not equal to LeBron James in basketball prowess. I'm not equal to my wife in the capacity to bear children. We're not equal at all. In what imaginary are we, are we equal? And where did that imaginary come from? Didn't come from the Greeks. Didn't come from the Romans. Careful. Careful with where you look. Follow the religions. He says that whenever a cop stops him, his heart beats really, really fast because he's black and he knows things can es escalate really quickly and boom, he's dead. It's true. It's true. But it's one truth among many. He fears for his 18-year-old brother constantly too. With some justification. Again, Watch Lowry and McWhorter. Please watch Lowry and McWhorter if you want to watch good conversations about these issues. Wes says his job is to get in front of the conflict and be as articulate and calm as he can. But it's not that I'm not angry. I'm the most angry. But what I want, I say to pierce the heart. It's a slow, gradual change, but it starts with communication. This is a Protestant preacher saw he gives the soldier a hug. He's a preacher, that one. 
some pro some protest some protesters are now sitting in the middle of Sunset Boulevard. This is what democracy looks like. Really? I thought democracy looked like going to a voting booth. Because I'll tell you read the history. Please, please, please read the history. As Jordan Peterson said, learn something before you go to set the world right. He said, put your house in perfect order. And I think, well, then none of us are going to do anything. But at least learn what you can. Take in wisdom. Here's the thing. There is a vision of order without hierarchy or authority. Really? Really? Think about that. Work on that hard. Can it be sustained amidst human beings who are biologically not equal? Structurally not equal? We're not really asking, we're real, <laughs> we're not really asking religious questions. No. Typo on my slide. We're really asking religious questions. What is a human being? What is good? What is evil? How do we get together? What does redemption look like? How is it achieved? Now, the main case against religion that you hear is it does nothing. All that liturgy, all that walking around, all that play acting in church, all that all that kneeling, all those magic words. Well, suddenly a whole bunch of atheists out there are performing and kneeling and trying to say magic words. Now, oh shoot, we got Ben Shapiro and Benjamin Boyce. I meant Benjamin Boyce. Benjamin Boyce is skeptical. Why is he skeptical? He's, he's watched something. He was at Evergreen. He's the chronicler of the little microcosm of, well, it's sort of woke New England. That's what Evergreen wanted to be, a city on a hill. The place, and, and notice for how many people, that's exactly what they want college to be. College is the city on the hill, where, where in college you get to practice the kingdom of God. And you're trained by professors. What do they profess? Where did colleges come from? Why is Ben skeptical? Details matter. The law acts as if we are equal. But are we? If it feels, it feels good to be a victim, one of many Lowry and McWhorter videos to watch. McWhorter says it's religion. And he isn't being flattering. He says, it's church. And what he means by that is, it's idol. It's a performance. But it's not law. And things don't change. And he lays out the white problem, which is religion. And the black problem, which, watch the video. I'll let them speak for themselves. But what do we do in church? Here's Northside, Northside Chapel in the 70s. What do we do in church? We practice. We act it out. Jordan Peterson, Biblical Series, Episode 1. We watch each other. We act it out. We say aspirational words we can't live up to. We ask for forgiveness. We pronounce release from blood guilt. And we do it repeatedly. Why do we do it repeatedly? It isn't because, and I think this is the defining Look up, oh, what was his name? The strange case of guilt. Well, that, was it. that wasn't it. You see, wokeism doesn't have a pronouncement of pardon. And there's no authority. Remember what we're talking about, whether or not soldiers should kneel. There's no authority that can pronounce pardon. That's exactly Douthat's point. The authority is gone. No one can speak for the imaginary. No one can say, white America, your sins have been paid for. Read McWhorter's piece on third wave anti-racism. Pay reparations. 
Will that do it? Look at the monk debate with Jordan Peterson. Someone mentions it. Jordan Peterson says, put a price on it. Tell me how much it would cost for America, for America to be free of the guilt of racism. Well, a lot of black Americans and a lot of white Americans would say there is no such price. It would have to be an infinite. It would have to be an infinite amount. Where could you find a sacrifice, a sacrifice with its value infinity? Well, shoot, now I'm knocking on the door of the Heidelberg Catechism. It would have to be a man to pay the price for humanity. It would have to be a god because it would be infinite. It would have to be a god and man. Why do they call him the Reverend Doctor? Martin Luther King Jr. Where would he get such powerful speech, such powerful words that, that, that stopped a much more racist country than we face today? And people who were formed in far greater racism for... I won't say greater because measuring these things is impossible. Far more out of the closet obvious racism than we have today. Where could he find such powerful words? Where did he find the people who would be willing to march and, and, and face fire hoses and take billy clubs and go to jail and not hit back and not wreck the town? Where could they have the discipline to know? You may march and you may not. And we're not having any stragglers. We're not putting a notice up on social media that says anybody who wants to become part of the movement can show up. No, they knew better than that. They had a period. And I work with. There's a few of them left. Members in my church who grew up in Texas and Louisiana and Florida under Jim Crow. They didn't just read about it in books. They lived it. And in my experience, if you want to know it at high resolution, talk to them. Listen to them. Because it's a lot different than the way it goes in the stories in our head. And how could the people following him be disciplined and organized. And how did he know? Read the first chapter. It's the Montgomery school boycott, the Montgomery bus boycott. We're marching. Why? Here's a law that needs to change. Oh, you have a goal. Why did the Occupy movement fail and fizzle? Why will this likely fail and fizzle? We're out there expressing and we're expecting the people on high to save us. Now, wait a minute. These are also the same people that you say have no authority and there's no thing above you because there can be no authority just blaze the trail yourself but if i go and i say the magic words then peace will come he didn't believe that and he had far more powerful words than anybody i've heard walking around making speeches the people that he led were a church they were trained they were trained in bowing to God. Well, what is God? God number one, God number two. What do we mean by that word? Don't jump to too easy conclusions about that word. Bowing to God. Asking for well, my sins. What do we do in church? We confess our sins to a priest or one to another. We confess our sins. We, like Chesterton, when asked... Who's, who's the world's problem? I am. Who's a racist? Me. Who's sexist? Me. Who's responsible for the problems in this world? I am. I'm not alone. But it's Vander Clay. Total depravity. Every part of my life is tainted by sin. And so I regularly practice the rituals and the words and... I go into training. How did these people do it? They practiced with their bodies. They learned to love. They learned to suffer with each other.
for each other. They learned to forgive. Their ideals were instantiated in stories, rehearsed, discussed, debated, wrestled with. When the time came, they were ready to go. It wasn't spur of the moment. Ask people today, when do you go to church? When I feel like it. Find me one Olympian who answers the question, when do you train? When I feel like it. Oh, you're going to win a gold medal with that attitude? I don't think so. So here are all these people in Bethesda. Bethesda, Maryland? I don't know. And everybody's tweeting this picture. It's so religious. And this is such a holy moment for these people. They haven't felt like this before. They're in ecstasy. Their world is coming together. And they want to do it again. So then they decide, let's meet here next week. And let's, let's do the rituals. Let's bend the knee and let's raise our arms. And, and let's sing. Because singing is really good. Because singing moves us. And let's do it every weekend, and then it rains. Well, we, we, we don't want the rain to stop us. Let's do it inside. Let's find a building. And so they find a building. And then they add the music. And then, well, we got to pay for the building, and we really need someone to organize and lead us. Let's, let's take a collection. Do you want to change the world? People think all it takes is what they see in the movies because we saw the pictures and then we do the motions and we say the words and then the change happens. Please, please, please read. Yeah, oh, religious people, they go in and they pray and then they think things happen. Really? 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 Some do. People think all it takes is what they see in the movies. A generation Mary suing its way to further frustration. They are lesser sons and daughters. They have not been trained. Remember this? One of the Jenner girls. Pepsi commercial. We knew enough to laugh that one off the airways. And to mock it with scorn. But do people know anybody now? They're LARPing their way to a very frustrating moment when the inevitable will happen because you're really going to dispel police brutality with the magic words and the magic motions? And that wasn't Peter Singer. Pinker on Twitter. About religious people? Really? Really? And this is what the public is doing? One bow isn't going to do it. There's going to be loaders. Everybody's walking around. Let's tear down the system. Yeah. You know, we just had a moment of the system coming to a pause and outrage... Because, well, should we shut everything down? Yeah, keep it all shut down. No, don't shut it down. The light stayed on. The water stayed on. Go live in another country where those things don't happen. We're so soft. We're such consumers. We're such victims of our own success. One bow isn't going to do it. And, well, who's right? Chloe or Ben? Maybe those two should have a conversation. How about the church? Church isn't ready. The main line has been falling through the floor. We're, we're going to put up the representations, and if we have the gay, disabled, lesbian priest, then it will come. Really? We have a consumer church. We have consumer marriages. We're the products of a consumer society that have been, become the products themselves. Oh yeah, let's let's do a Pepsi commercial about protesting. Here are the magic the magic rituals, here are the magic words. Now peace and justice and we don't even know. Watch the good place or upload or how many or Westworld or what have you. We don't even know what goodness is.
We just see the bad and say, that ain't it. Chesterton, Heretics, Chapter 2, I believe. So a while ago, Chloe was going to talk to um, Candace Owens. I thought, ooh, that'll be an interesting conversation. And I said, hey, be careful about the status differential there. That stuff is real. Those things mess up. Bring in someone with you. Brett said, I'm willing, irrespective of who moderates. I believe this discussion needs to happen sooner rather than later. I'd trust Brett with something like that. I think Brett could handle something. I've seen, I've seen Brett with Peterson, and, and I think, you know, I've, I've got a sense of Brett's patience and his listening, and, you know, he's a, he's a good party in the conversation. And I said, I agree. I'd trust Brett with something like that. And it was like Brett or Dave Rubin, and nothing against Dave Rubin, but I would rather have Brett. I trust Brett more than Dave. I trust Brett's political game more than Dave's. Yeah, you can watch some of the... I haven't said a lot about Dave Rubin. Um, I think what Brett is looking for started to decline about 500 years ago. And someone was like, well, what happened 500 years ago? Isn't that what we've been talking about? Isn't that what we're trying to figure out? Isn't that what we're working through? It's the Protestantization of feminism anti-racism it's the eschaton and the imaginary when do we want it now really really the book isn't this long for nothing training versus trying Brett is looking for a community he's looking for a new religion he's looking for in some ways a monastery, a community of people held together by an ideal. That's why he was at Evergreen, even though his brother doesn't think he should have been. I completely understand why Brett was at Evergreen. There's something behind that community that the community must practice in order to cohere. But what if you're barking up the wrong religious tree? Well, well, well how can you figure out the religion? What what station of language do you need to actually deal with this? Jordan Peterson knows. Sevilla King knows. They were therapists. Jordan Peterson says, you know, I, people couldn't really, couldn't really get into the transformation until they started using religious words. The new atheists are done. Here's some words for you. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. As a Christian, none of my enemies have flesh on them. All of my enemies are not material. What does that mean? Aren't those the things moving the fat moving the institutions the systems the forces does that mean that does that mean i'm a nazi and we'll just take away all systems and people will just be people that was the nazi plan read timothy snyder please but against rulers against the authorities what well, you mean like the human authorities no nah, not the ones with skin they're they're acting it out but that's not really what's moving the world. Against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil. Where? On the streets? In the corporate offices? No, no, no. Paul could have easily said, well, they're in the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem or in Herod's palaces strewn throughout Palestine or in in." the Roman palaces of the emperor, or, or, or Paul had those words. Why didn't he say that in the heavenlies? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't talk that way because I don't believe that stuff. Please tell me what's moving the world. How are you going to get a handle on what's moving the world? Well, words. Well, actions. Yeah, it's religious. 
Are we ready to have a religious conversation?